Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Now, another big problem with COM was the registry. Now, the registry all by itself is not a problem, right? You know, every operating system has a, has a location where you can write out data in a centralized manner. But the way that COM used the registry was pretty, pretty tough. <laughs> Essentially, COM had a lot of hard-coded paths, like where is this DLL located on the machine? So it was very, very simple for an end user to accidentally move something or delete something or rename something, and then the whole application is toast. You have to reinstall everything, right? So when I first started doing .NET programming, you know, my whole world was all around H key classes root. I couldn't even conceive of how things would work if we didn't have the registry. Well, truth of the matter is, in the world of .NET, components are not registered. When you go ahead and compile down a .NET application, the registry is untouched. So the runtime engine is not going to go to the system registry to figure out where things live. There is a whole new set of heuristics that are going to be used in the background. And part of that puzzle is the global assembly cache. Okay. Now I'm going to pull up a window here in just a second that shows you what the GAC looks like. Um, in the full complete C Sharp class, we have a whole chapter dedicated to installing things to the GAC, how to version assemblies. We talk about the distinction between a public, I'm sorry, a um, private and a shared assembly. We talk about XML configuration files. But here, let me just kind of give you a taste of how things look. Right? So I'm just going to go here to my global assembly cache. One little FYI, if you've been doing .NET programming for a while, did you know that in version 4.0 of .NET, we have a new GAC? We got the old GAC and we got the new GAC. There's actually a new location now where the 4.0 libraries are installed. I'll just go to the old GAC for right now. This is the historic GAC where uh, people kind of can go there and, and look at it and say, oh yeah, something looks unique here. So what we basically have here is a location on a .NET machine where machine-wide libraries are installed. Right? So when you have a library installed in the GAC here, we give that a special name. We're going to call that a shared assembly. If we just kind of scroll through, you might see some familiar sounding names. Let's say get down towards the S's. Like you might have even used some of these before, right? System, system.core, that's where we have most of our link support. Notice we have a number of assemblies here to work with database programming. We have libraries here that let us do graphical rendering, right? network programming, speech analysis and speech input, web development, a whole bunch of libraries. Right? Now, if you ever write your own custom library and you intend for it to be a machine-wide library, you can install it in the GAC as well. I'm not going to get into how to do that in this little overview, but for right now, I just want you to appreciate that in the world of .NET programming, the registry is no longer used for component lookup. Now you can still program against the registry. I mean, maybe you want to use the registry to put in some application settings. That's fine. I'm just talking about there's no registration of components. Now maybe the biggest problem with COM, now remember, I'm, I'm a guy that used to do a lot of COM, was the fact that it was just COM. <laughs> it was not a very forgiving architecture. You had a lot of infrastructure that you had to put together. And if you didn't do it, things just would not work as expected. So definitely remember what I said at the start of this little video, right? Remember that the .NET programming environment is not some big wrapper around COM. It's a completely different thing altogether. The only thing that .NET and COM really have in common is they both came from Microsoft. Now, many moons ago, I used to work for a company called Mech. You might not know the name of the company, 
but I bet you you know the name of some of their products. Uh, you might remember some video games for kids called Oregon Trail, Amazon Trail. Well, I used to work there, and we had to write code that would work on the Macintosh and on Windows. So we had a pretty, pretty gnarly proprietary library of code to do that. But I always have a soft spot in my heart for the Macintosh. Well, when I was doing COM programming, you know, the Mac was off limits. I mean, for all practical purposes, COM is all about the Windows operating system. And that's no longer true with .NET programming, right? Just like Java, .NET gives us the ability to build a piece of software and have it execute on different operating systems. But how that actually works is a very different approach than Java took. And I'll speak about that at the end of our overview. Um, suffice it to say for right now, Microsoft.net is not the only .NET out there. So that's all I want to say about COM. We'll get to the, the good stuff as they say right now. But um, take away from all that, definitely .NET is the way going forward. It has been for a number of years. Um, the only time you really see much about COM anymore is for some really low level stuff or uh, some infrastructure pieces. Okay, so now let's talk about what .NET actually is. Well, from a marketing term, it's just a buzzword, but from a programming, programmer's point of view, it actually is a set of services, right? So let me just kind of hit the highlights here. I think I'll, I'll start right here. And I think when people hear the term .NET, it's very easy to think about internet, and then you think about web programs. Now, the .NET platform has great support for web development. ASP.NET, right? AJAX supports working with model view controller, all that stuff is part of the framework. But remember that .NET is meant to be a one-stop shop. It is not just for doing web development. There are many different toolkits that we can use to build desktop programs as well. We could use WPF, we could use Windows Forms, we can also use Silverlight, because that can also be installed to run on the desktop as well. Another thing to keep in mind .NET really does not give a hoot which language you use to build your software. When it comes to mainstream development, I would guess most people will pick between C Sharp or Visual Basic, but I'll show you a website in a little bit here where there are dozens and dozens of different .NET compilers that you can download. And if you have a language out there, you probably have a .NET compiler for it. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. I've already mentioned that the .NET platform is not limited to the Windows operating system. Okay? What Microsoft did when they rolled out their platform is something a little uncharacteristic for Microsoft. They actually submitted to ECMA International these two very important specifications, 33.4 and 33.5. The .NET platform and the C-sharp language are standards and other companies can use these ECMA specs to build their own implementation of the framework. And that's the key to the platform independence that I'll talk about a little bit later on. Now it's also important to kind of remember what .NET isn't, right? Remember it's not just about the web, even though the web support is really good. It's not built on COM. And this is important to notice here too. It's not an operating system all by itself. You know, the .NET framework has to be installed on top of your operating system. Now, newer versions of Windows, like Windows 7, when you install it on a new computer, it'll install the platform automatically. But if you were running a fresh copy of Windows XP, you would have to download the free runtime. And if you're trying to install .NET on a different operating system, like Solaris, well, then you have a whole different approach, and that's with those non-Microsoft implementations. So here's how things look really high level, right? Let's kind of break down this graphic. All right, starting at the bottom, we have some operating system. Well, the platform, remember, is going to be running on top of the operating system. So let's assume that we're running on Windows, right? Well, Microsoft has a free executable called .NET FX. Now, by the way, that's not the exact name of the 
executable that you'd install. The exact name will differ based on which version of .NET you're going to be installing, right? But it'll have .NET FX somewhere inside of the name. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.